Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are we feeling this morning today, church? Woo, I heard a couple woos. That's awesome, that's awesome. We're so happy to have you with us on this Sunday morning and a special welcome to those that are online with us as well. I'm going to invite all of us to stand and uh, just as we settle into being together this morning, I just want us to ponder the, the mightiness of God of his ways and how he works in our lives and among us and just think about the ways that he has loved us he has provided for us and he has fought for us even in this last week in this last month and in just the duration of our lives and with one voice church let's declare this today let us worship the eternal God, the source of love and life who creates us. Let us worship Jesus Christ, the risen one who lives among us. Let us worship the spirit, the holy fire who renews us. And say this with me, church. To the one true God, be praised in all times and places through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's sing together this morning, church.
And amen. It is so good to worship together this morning, church. Just want to announce that if you are in grades one through seven, you can be dismissed at this point. Parents, if you've already registered them, your kids can find the volunteers that are in the foyer and they can be walked to their classes. We hope you have a great rest of your morning. As we were rehearsing this morning, I kept thinking about this particular word and the word that I was that kept coming to my mind was oneness and the oneness that we have when we're in God. Everyone in this room is so different, but we still have this bond that keeps us together despite our differences. And when we accept Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives and our hearts, we don't just get personal salvation. It is coming into this story. We get not only a heavenly father, but we get brothers and sisters as well. And I think that's really beautiful. As Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 13 to 18, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations, his purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Let's give thanks for God and his spirit this morning as we continue to sing this morning, church.
Let's pray together, church. Thank you for the gift of freedom that you've won for us, Jesus. Freedom from the consequences of our sin, which is death. Freed up to love. Free from fear. And so even in these moments, we who have been singing this truth bring to you those places where we're anxious and scared and fearful, things that are keeping us up at night, the things that we can't control. And we lay those down before you and we invite you into those places and spaces. May this not just be a song that we sing, may it be our lived experience that we are free. Thank you, Father, for our adoption into your family. I pray this morning that we, your children, would have power together with all of your people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. Thank you that you've brought all kinds of people, men and women, young and old, diverse ethnic groups, into your family, and you've made us your church. In your mercy and by your Spirit's power, would you help us to work hard at keeping the unity of the Spirit. May we be humble, gentle, patient, and bear with one another in love. Together as uh, this faith family, Lord, we want to lift up Bonnie and the, the Penner family. And we ask that you would give them abundant faith and strength and peace as they grieve the loss of Henry, of Harry. And for others who suffer, who walk along with others who are carrying great burdens, for those who are struggling in mind or body or spirit, you graciously draw near to them in this day? Would you speak the words that they need most to hear in these moments, Lord? You know each one of us here. You know us better than we know ourselves. And so come and shepherd your people, we pray. And towards that end, we just open up ourselves to you this morning, Lord. We open up ourselves to hear your word to us, as we open up Ephesians chapter 4 this morning, grant to your church courage, clarity, to be who you have already made us to be. And to do that together for your glory, we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat at this time. I want to say good morning to you all and welcome you. Thank you for coming. Those of you who've joined us online, it's great that you're here with us as well. Uh, thanks for gathering as the church this morning. And as you heard me pray, um, Harry Penner passed away recently, and so we do want to extend our love and our condolences to 
uh, Bonnie and the Penner family. Those of you who know them, uh, we want to let you know that there will be a memorial service taking place on Monday, October 23rd at 1 p.m. here at the church. So please uh, take note of that. And then also, just to let you know, one other thing that's not in the announcements, the recorded announcements, next weekend's the long weekend. It's the um, weekend where we remember and advance the truth and reconciliation process within our nation. So we're going to be praying about that uh, next weekend as a church community. But the day before that, on Saturday, September 30th, the Semiamu First Nations will be hosting a truth and reconciliation walk down at the beach. And that's going to be followed up with some events at uh, Semiamu Park. So we wanted you to just be aware of this. Um, this is a tangible thing for uh, us to engage in. Those of us who maybe want to educate ourselves a little bit more or participate in the continued reconciliation of a relationship with our local Semiamu First Nations people. So more information uh, easily found online. Just Google Truth and Reconciliation Semiamu uh, Walk. So that's uh, just all that you need to hear from me. A few more announcements uh, at the screen above. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie and here's what you need to know. We want to remind all of you who have signed up that Starting Point, Baptism Lunch, and Membership Lunch are all happening today. We look forward to connecting with you after the 11 a.m. service. Starting on Wednesday, October 4th and continuing into November, we will be meeting in the mornings for a time of prayer at 7 a.m. Anyone and everyone is welcome to join us for these times of prayer as you are able. We will be meeting in the church office and coffee will be served. No registration is required. We hope to see you there. If you are interested in growing and providing spiritual care through compassion, visitation, and spiritual companionship, we invite you to the Spiritual Care course happening every Thursday evening in October from 7 to 9 p.m. Over the span of four interactive evenings, we will help you develop a better understanding of who you are in Christ and support you in your own journey in caring for others. Please register online to attend. We thank God for you and your collective generous giving, which enables us to keep the lights on, heat the building, provide food to those in need, and faithfully serve hundreds of people every week in Jesus' name. We encourage everyone as you're able to participate in worship through the giving of your finances. To learn more, visit our website or at the Connect Center after the service. That's all you need to know. Have a great week. Good morning. Hi, everybody. There we go. In college days, uh, a couple friends and I were walking along the road, and we found a bathtub carelessly strewn on the side of the road one day in the middle of winter. And so, obviously, we picked it up, and uh, we carried it back to our dorm. Now, we were living in Cairnport, Saskatchewan at the time, and if you've only experienced BC winters, like, you haven't experienced winter yet. You maybe also have an experience boredom because eight months in frigid cold means a lot of time indoors typically. When we took this bathtub home, we, we threw it in a snowbank in front of our dorm and it was as if lightning struck. We, we all had the same idea at the same moment. We saw this bathtub sitting there and we thought, this needs to become our dorm hot tub. And so we got to work and we patched the holes on it and we found some insulation that we could kind of build around it into the snowbank and we all put our bathing suits on. We uh, go outside, we fill all these buckets with hot water, dump the hottest water we can find into this bathtub and the three of us are kind of tucked up into a little ball uh, trying to sit in this hot tub, staying warm with our toques on in the middle of winter in Saskatchewan. I had a picture of it, but I didn't think you wanted to see that much skin, so I just <laughs> left, left it out. 
Anyways, it stayed hot for about two minutes total, and, uh, and then none of us wanted to get out because it's freezing cold and we don't have shirts on or shoes on and those kind of things. And so we begged and, and borrowed from anybody who walked by just to fill us up a hot bucket of water, bring it out and dump it on us. We'd throw a little cold water out, they'd dump hot water in. We ended up staying in for 30 minutes. Not bad for some winter fun in Saskatchewan. Some might call it immature. Others may say creative geniuses. Who's to say? Shortly after, our our residence director was not too happy about this hot tub, bathtub, on the front lawn of the dorm, and he insisted we move it. He just didn't catch the vision, you know? It was pretty cold out there, and winter seemed very long, so we determined to do it when the snow melted. Our RD wasn't happy with that timeline, and he kept on our case. We left it for weeks that turned into months, And eventually the snow melted and some other creative students from the dorm thought of another use for the bathtub. They thought, I wonder if we could conduct a little experiment and see if bathtubs either bounce or break. (laughs) So quite impressively, they managed to haul this bathtub up on the roof of the dorm and uh, they proceeded to walk to the end of the dorm and were about to throw it off. Now the timing of this was like either very unfortunate or comic genius, depending on how far you are from the events. But the RD was walking down the lower hallway just as the students were on the roof, hucking the bathtub off the roof. And so it turns out that bathtubs can bounce sometimes. And this bathtub landed on its front edge and bounced backwards through the window as the RD was walking down the hallway, uh, (laughs) so upset already about this bathtub. And he was more than a little bit mad as this bathtub came shattering through the window towards him. No longer infants, eh? That's the name of our series right now. Comes directly from Ephesians 4 where Paul is urging the church to grow up in the ways that God has designed for them. Scott, you sure you want me preaching this one? You sure? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Isn't it funny how our physical bodies grow up with or without the rest of us sometimes? Our emotional, intellectual, or spiritual maturity does not have to align with our age. We can be 20 years old and playing with large household items that end up defacing property. Yes, we had to pay for the window. But there's just no guarantee that as you get older, you will get more mature in every area of your life. That's why Paul writes to the church in Ephesus to not remain infants in their spiritual lives. Because it's possible. We can be adult humans who have been Christians for some time even. And we're still spiritual kids. If we don't allow the Spirit of God to increasingly grow us into the image of Christ, if we don't seek after God and put effort into our faith and following of Jesus, we might just end up playing with spiritual bathtubs our whole lives and never becoming all that God has created us to be. And lest this growing up sound dull or humdrum, The desire that God has for our lives is flourishing. And so as we mature, we mature in love. Our lives become richer in our experience of love. We become more joyful. Joy grows in us. We become more peaceful. Peace deepens in us. And ultimately, we become more like Jesus, which if you know him, that's all that we could hope for. And at the same time, we become more fully ourselves as God has created us to be, blessing others and taking greater responsibility in our lives. So a quick recap of where we are as we come into this series. We are in the book of Ephesians. It's a New Testament letter that Paul the Apostle is writing to the church in Ephesus, but it was likely a circular letter, which meant that it was circulated around a number of churches to be read and, and uh, taken in for a number of different communities. In the first three chapters of Paul's letter, Paul gives this glorious description of the gospel. That is the new reality that God has brought about through the events of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. He beautifully draws it out and he leaves us in this place of wonder at all that God has done for us in Christ. 
And then he begins chapter four with this resounding, therefore. Therefore, live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And really, all of chapter four is expanding on how we practically step into the new reality that God has made possible through Christ. How does a gospel community look and live? Paul wants to get very practical here. Last week, Scott, via Paul, began spelling it out for us. If the Spirit of God is working in us as a community, the character of Christ is being formed in us. We are growing in humility, in gentleness, in patience, and in bearing with, putting up with one another in love. Scott gave such helpful descriptions to us of each of these virtues and how we can deepen in them through the Spirit. Each of these virtues was meant to build toward what Paul says next. Paul is going to bring to a head what he's been getting at. If Christ has done all of this for you, chapters 1 to 3, how does that play out now in your life and practice? I'm genuinely interested to hear how each of you would answer that. If there's one primary way that Christ's work plays out in the life of us as Christians, what is it? And so we pick up in verse 3 with Paul saying to the churches in Asia Minor, this, hear this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. What's the primary way that we align our lives with Christ and his gospel? Maintain unity. We say, well, what about love? Yep, love is in there. It's at the heart of it. You can't have unity without love. What about forgiveness? Yep, if you want unity, you'll need to be ready to extend and receive a lot of forgiveness. Uh, Last week we learned about humility. That is a big one. Yes, again, one of the main ingredients of unity is humility. God cannot dwell in a proud, self-reliant community. What about mission? Trust me, unity in this world is the most compelling witness you can possibly offer. You want mission? Practice unity. Make every effort for it, Paul says. As in, we are active participants in whether unity, unity is flourishing here or not. Commentators say that the English is actually a little bit weak here even. It's more like zealously pursue unity. Zealously hold up the unity of the Spirit. Like take care of it. Make it a top priority. Refuse to act in ways that undermine it. Sometimes I think that as Christians, we still have a confused relationship with effort because we know the Christian life is about grace, right? It's not about earning, so I can just sit and let it happen to me, right? All I needed to do was believe, and now I'm good. Well, yes, it's about grace, but we cooperate with grace. We cooperate with the Spirit, and that means we cooperate through our actions, through our efforts, Pursuing God and, deeper tra- and the deeper transformation he brings. Pursuing unity. This takes effort. As I've quoted before, Dallas Willard fam- famously writes, grace is not opposed to effort. It's opposed to earning. Some of us need to rethink, according to scripture, what the role of effort is when it comes to following Jesus. Paul doesn't shy away from it. Make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. And then he gets to the best part. Paul does not call us to create unity either, to make unity from scratch. What does he say? He says, make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. It's already here. We we start with it. God says, unity is the result of what Christ has already done for you. 
I'm going to read a little bit again of what Isabel already read for us, but in Ephesians 2, he tells us this amazing news of what Christ has done. It says, now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. You know, Jew and Gentile, it's Paul's context, might also think male and female, rich and poor, old and young, left and right, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The dividing walls have been broken down in Christ. He has made peace between us by making a way for all of us to have peace with God. He's killed hostility. We all have access to the Father through the one spirit. Unity with God and others is yours in Christ. So back to chapter four. Maintain the unity of the spirit. You don't need to create it because church, you already have it. You just need to maintain it. It's like your dad gives you a car. He doesn't just give you the parts and say, okay, figure it out, build it. He gives you the car and says, enjoy it. Invite others into it. Just don't crash it. Maintain it. It, It's yours. Drive and enjoy. No sooner has dad gotten the words out of his mouth, we're like, sorry, what'd you say, dad? crash. We don't create unity, but we can certainly mess with it, can't we? This is all too evident in our day when near every, near every time the church appears on the news, it's another story of scandal, division, and disunity. But we don't really need the news. We've all experienced and likely contributed to disunity at times. I know I have. God forgive us. It's interesting that we know what it feels like when we discover, you know, somebody has talked or said something bad behind our backs, and yet most of us have engaged in that too. Often it doesn't even need to come out of our mouths. The thoughts we have toward one another can be so full of judgment. God forgive us. We know what it feels like to trust something with someone, uh, trust someone with something of ourselves and for that person not to hold it in confidence. It's a betrayal of trust, an undermining of unity. And then when we have been hurt, we tend to hold on to our grudges for too long, refusing to extend the grace that we ourselves have received in great measure from God. God forgive us. Too often we lack humility, we lack gentleness, we lack patience, we lack love. We can see people's shortcomings long before we see their beauty. We're too often slow to listen, quick to speak, quick to become angry. We might wonder if the modern church is more trained in disunity than unity. God forgive us. But here is the good news that Paul can't help but remind us. We can mess with the unity that God has given us. We can crash the car, but we can't destroy it. God's like, okay, that, that, that's not what I had in mind. But work with me. Let's, let's fix this. I've got everything we need I just want you to join me and we'll have you on the road again in no time. To be clear, we can opt out of God's unity. I'm tired of this mess. We can walk. But God's unity never walks on us. 
We have it available to us all the time. We can't get rid of it despite our best efforts. Crash, crash, crash. That's got to be a write-off, God. You can't fix that one. No, we can fix it. It's never a write-off with God. Because our unity is not first and foremost ours to make or break. It's God's. And thankfully, that's where this car analogy ends. Because God does not just give us unity as if it's something outside of himself. We only have unity because we have him. True unity, the the kind that Christ died for, only exists in him. We don't have it apart from him. He doesn't say, here's unity, take care of it, I'll be over here having a nap. No, our unity is him. We don't have it apart from him. He himself is the one who unites us across all all of our diversity in love. Hear how he describes the basis of our unity in the following verses. He says this, there is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Now, this is really beautiful. This is an early Trinitarian expression of belief, even before the doctrine of the Trinity was named. Did you hear it all in there? One Spirit, one Lord, one God and Father. The oneness of God is the basis of our unity. Three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit that exist in eternal unity. God has had loving community in himself for all of eternity. Wrap your minds around that. Unity exists in God because he is one in three persons. And Paul is rejoicing in the reality that the unity that exists in the, God, in the Godhead for eternity past has been opened to us in Christ. It's like God has opened himself and invited us in. We are his body through the one spirit. Not that we lose ourselves and get absorbed into God like some religions might think, We remain distinctly ourselves while being invited into unity with God. This is amazing stuff. This is why Paul is so hyped on the gospel. The unity that God's people are invited into with one another is the unity that exists in the eternal triune God. It's because we are in the one spirit the one Lord and the one God and Father that we are drawn to one another in love. And so our unity is first with him and then through him our unity is with one another. So when I talk behind my brother's back telling telling, um, someone else what I don't like about him, I'm actually working against the triune God who is working to pull us together in love. And you know what? I I feel that inside when I do those kind of things. But when I celebrate my brother behind his back and tell people how awesome he is and what I love about him, I feel that too. We're working with God in his love. When I choose to hold on to my faith but withdraw from the church, I'm moving against the flow. But when I choose to commit, commit to be a part of community, even when I don't always feel like it, I'm working with God. When I hold on to bitterness, I am working against the grace of the Spirit in this community. I'm walking upstream. But when I let go of that bitterness... Entrusting that wound and the person who wronged me to God instead of holding on to them myself? That is happening in God because God is calling us toward this unity. He's empowering us for it. He's helping us not not to work against it, but to work with him 
as he brings all of us into a unity of love with one another. Okay, quickly then. Four more ones that Paul describes as the basis of our unity in Christ. So yes, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father who is over all, but also one body. That is, we are united because we are part of the same body, the body of Jesus. That is, the church of Jesus, spread around the globe, made up of all who trust in and have received the Son. We here at Peace Portal are a local church, and God is saying there's actually only one church. And it's the whole family of God spread throughout the world, made up of an incredible diversity of people who all share in the same spirit. You have unity with your brothers and sisters that you haven't even met yet in Uganda and in Iraq and in India. You you start with unity because you are part of the one body through the spirit. He continues, just as you are called to one hope when you are called. What's our one hope? I think Paul is, is flashing back here to uh, Ephesians 1.10. I'll put it up there, but it recall, this is where Paul makes the hope explicit. He says, this is what God was up to in Jesus. This is, what, this is God's end game. God has a plan to unite all things in heaven and on earth in Christ. There's going to be this great unity. We, as people, God's people, will be fully united with God in the most profound experience of love and joy. And we will be perfectly united with one another in that day. No more hate, no more violence, no more disunity. And all creation, in fact, will experience this unity of heaven and earth, and it will be restored to its created intent. This is what we pray for when we pray, Lord, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Can we experience more of what will be now, here? You are uniting heaven and earth in Christ. That's not often how we talk about the gospel, and it probably deserves a lot more consideration and contemplation. But it's a core part of it, and it's really beautiful. Okay, one one faith. Essentially, this is what Paul's been describing in all of Ephesians 1 to 3. And so if you haven't read those chapters yet as we go through this this sermon series, it would be so good to just go back this week, read Ephesians 1 to 3 again, soak in the wonder of what God has done for us in Christ. That's the one faith. This one faith is both faith in someone, Jesus, the triune God, and faith in something, that is the gospel of Jesus and how he calls us to live in alignment with him. So in a sermon like this, when we celebrate the beauty and wonder of unity, as moderns or postmoderns, we're, we're tempted to say, yes, unity, like that's what I'm all about, that's what I've been saying. People can live how they want, believe what they want, think however they want, and God will receive us all the same because he's about unity. But that's unity on our terms. The unity that Paul is describing is not unity on my terms. It's unity on God's terms. And so we aim to align our life and our practice with the one faith that has been historically passed on and is rooted in the person, teaching, and work of Jesus. Who Paul wants to remind, remind us is actually over all and through all and in all. As if to say, don't forget, he, his, he is the one who made this unity possible. And he has made everything, in fact. And he holds all things together, in fact. And he rules over all of creation. He assigns value to all of creation. And he sovereignly determines what is right and what is wrong. If we want unity, we must align ourselves with the one faith. So please hear me. God's intention in the one faith is not to exclude 
It's to radically include the beautiful unity of God's family as we live God's way in the world is meant to be a witness so that if if anyone is willing to come to the one Lord and receive the one baptism and believe in the one faith, they can come in and experience the joy of unity with God and unity of the Spirit with others. It's open to all who will receive the one God and the one faith. Okay, one baptism. Whether Paul's talking about baptism in water or baptism in the Spirit would likely not have been a first century question. These baptisms were understood intimately connected. And all who believe in Jesus and desire to follow him throughout all the centuries of the church and all the different traditions of the church have been baptized into Jesus through the Spirit. If you haven't been baptized and you've put your faith in Christ, please seriously consider it. It is just one of those core elements of our unity and of our union with Jesus. It's hard to imagine why we would resist Jesus' call to this if we have given our lives to Christ. And if you haven't put your faith in Jesus and you want to or want to talk about it, please come talk with someone, pray with someone either at the front uh, towards the end of the service or throughout the week you can email one of us. We'd love to talk and to pray with you. So we find unity in, in these seven ones. Unity with God and with one another. They are the foundation by which we have the unity of the Spirit that we are called to make every effort to maintain. Church, without a doubt, there are a lot of forces pulling us apart these days. You know, whether it's secularism or expressive individualism or polarized politics or specific topics or specific wounds, whether it's the enemy or our flesh or the world around us, there are so many places where fracture can come into our communities of faith in Christ. But what we hear in this passage from the word of God is that before all of those external factors that aim to fracture, above all of those factors, more powerful than all of those factors, there is a presence that is pulling us together. God himself is in our midst and he is our unity. And he is over us and in us, and through us. And when we feel like giving up, he's saying, press on. And when we resist having to say things like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have, he's calling us to take that courageous step. And when we'd rather just float along and think about ourselves and our enjoyment, He's calling us to move outward in love, to care about this community, to serve others in love, to invite someone over for dinner who we wouldn't typically have, to see one another in our places of need, to pray for one another, not just in times of prayer, but along the way, to maintain the unity of the Spirit because, friends, it's in God's heart for us. And not just for our good, but for the good of the world. I'll close with this. Uh, Worship team, you guys can join me up here. But it says, Jesus prays for us before he goes to the cross. Did you know that? He prays for his disciples. And then he says, and not only them, but all who will believe in me through them, that's us. And this is what's on his heart as his final prayer before his crucifixion. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity 
Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. There is no more compelling witness to a self-made world facing immense loneliness than a church that loves one another deeply in all of our diversity because we are united as one body in the one spirit under one hope through the one Lord sharing in one faith and one baptism with the one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. Church, may we make every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite us to stand.
spirit the one spirit is in our midst he is in us and he is drawing us together into love and I wonder if there are ways he's calling you specifically to take a courageous step whether that's uh, inviting someone to pray for you whether that's uh, taking a step towards someone you felt that rub against or you felt that you're holding a grudge against just encourage you to pay attention to what the Spirit's inviting you to this morning for the sake of our community and for the sake of our witness to the world around us. And so uh, I bless you this morning in that. We're gonna have some prayer people here and we'd love if you uh, prayed with us, but you could also pray with someone beside you. One more thing, uh, we are starting a course called Life in the Spirit a week and a bit from now. And uh, it's a sweet space to explore a little bit more of how the Spirit works in our lives, how we can listen to Him, how we can align our lives with Him, how we can uh, discover our spiritual gifts, things like that. I would love if some of you considered joining us for that. Go in the one Father who is over all and in all and through all. Go in the one Lord who reigns and go in the one spirit who unites us all. Amen.
to the land And all who've gone before us And all who will believe Will sing the song of ages to the land Your name is the highest Your name is the greatest Your name stands above them all All thrones and dominions All powers and positions Your name stands above them all And the angels cry Holy, all creation cries Holy, you are lifted high Holy, holy forever And if you've been forgiven And if you've been redeemed Sing the song forever to the land and if you walk in freedom and if you bear his name Sing the song forever to the land We'll sing the song Never runs dry, you can try.
trust the Father, He is good and He satisfies. Come to the light, leave the empty shadow, trade the night. You can trust the Father, He is good and He satisfies. Send His Son, Jesus, and we are made alive. Come to the bread, all of you who hunger never runs out. You can trust the Father, He is good, and He satisfies. Say the Son, Jesus.
Yeah. 
changing 